won't waste any more time with me talking that people can read the program, so we're going to let you get started. Thank you so much. Uh, my credit goes to Dr. Kelly for bringing this uh, Thank you. 
universe and the dispossess of two continents. This is one of my favorite pictures by uh, one of the Southwestern um, key artists in photo uh, art. And before going into detail, um, Ross doesn't like readouts, but if you allow two pages to share, I think that would give you guys a, a little more understanding of why I'm doing this whole thing and what I want to um, achieve with my students and conferences and all these engagements. What does being born multiracial imply? How can one cope with the prejudice surrounding blended agricultural heritage? How can literature contribute to the self-understanding of millions of complex ancestry in North America? Who by population statistics are becoming the majority, the new normal? What is the role and responsibility of those who formulate public opinion on mixed race? How can parents and children cope with and relate to the problem of multiracial family relations? What kind of examples can literary texts offer for identity reformulation for a more balanced, content, and socially effective personality? How can we approach those who have developed psychological and social issues due to the negative experiences of their childhoods and early adult lives? How can Native America, critical indigenous and mixed race studies expand the scope of American studies? And last but not least, how can a European reader of Southwestern literature contribute to the understanding of blended heritage and existence, the related social complexities and literature? My interest in these questions emerged from two directions. Earlier, I had explored the concept of the white man's Indian, the common practice of going native. Following the publication of Going Indian Cultural Appropriation in recent North American literature, I realized that besides the Anglo American Canadians <coughs> who have encountered indigenous culture and decided to develop a supposed tribal identity component of any risk for any reason, <coughs> there is a growing number of people who have indigenous ancestry on the one side of the family and who also struggle with defining themselves with social acceptance and visions of who they are. The second stimulus emerged during my full mission in New Mexico where cultural, racial, and ethnic mixing is common. And the personal examples of identity confusion and positive coping strategies have always been exciting to observe and then thought provoking to read about in Southwestern literature. I have met visual artists and <coughs> heritage who mostly identify themselves as Native American and have studied related areas of psychology, sociology, philosophy, and post-colonial studies. I started to realize that the town runners in Stockholm days, the way to rainy mountains, on the so-called blood trails, or as mentioned in Greek blood messages, basically reenact the ceremony that circles novel of the same time to accept those around. The ancient pattern of recognizing and revitalizing one's indigenous roots, while I also had to understand that this is a, this, this special learning process and complex social adjustment entail multiple impacts and often prove not doable for the majority of those contemporary mixed race individuals for whom indigeneity is not a real life uh, connection. But just like for anyone else, a rather romantic idea that may result in rejection on both tribal and American urban community sites. So, um, the way I connect to the topic of this conference, revitalization, I think is um, now um, pretty understandable that the revitalization and reconnection is not an easy thing at, at hand and this refusal and rejection and doubt and concerns and suspicion at both sides both uh, in both cultures and communities uh, surround uh, a number of these um, identity renegotiation procedures but what I found really exciting is the way how the colonial uh, paradigm is transferred and transcended and how the binaries disappear and are def um, kind of deflected, uh, how fluidity and limitability is step by step accepted. And I also investigated um, the psychology reflected in literature, obviously, the psychology of, you know, um, how is it, how it, what kind of elements have an impact on the particular individual's choices. <laughs> 
that a person makes when highlighting any part of the identity that is available for that person. I'm also excited about this agency reclaimed the same way as it happens, for instance, when you, um, everybody else, uh, all the presenters have discussed so far how you revitalize and uh, language and through that perhaps gain, gain agency over um, uh, traditional culture. And also, I'm really excited to see how post-colonial nations and Canada and the US in particular perceive indigeneity as part of the blend. So what do you do with this whole thing, that there are people who are mixed blood, considering themselves Native American, and then what do you do with the other cloth, and how do you relate to, um, to them? OK, for the academic and, um, context, obviously you can see that traditional American studies and Canadian studies cannot capture these complexities. So we have to go for cross-cultural psychology, for regionalism studies, for mixed race studies, for critical indigenous studies. And the more we integrate into um, the research, the better I believe, because a single focus, single approach, single perspective doesn't seem to work, at least not for me in these um, endeavors. Um, and I also call for a revision of what Europeans and what European higher education and academia believes about uh, you know, the goal and the mission and the responsibility of discussing anything related to indigenous in North America. Um, at this um, previous conference, um, I simply asked um, colleagues to, to think about why we do what we do. And uh, that's such a different question if you compare 40 years ago at the time of the communist regimes when people had this romanticized images of the Indian and what it meant. And there is a whole kind of a library literature on, on that that I discussed in the previous group. For the paradigm shift, I don't go into detail on each and every item. I just want you to see that during the 1980s, for a number of reasons, social, social changes stimulated the shift that I argue for that you can see in visual arts and literature. As for portraits, self-portraits in visual arts and autobiographies uh, of, um, uh, in, um, in uh, literature, because both, like all these genders, seem to reflect. In up until the 80s, you have this face, faces and portraits of white and red, cowboy and India, and this kind of division of the body is pretty much there in these um, paintings and photos and other pieces of visual arts, and the same applies to literature that up until the 80s there is this kind of constant struggle and stigma, um, um, confusion about I'm not good enough, I'm not Indian enough, I'm not white enough, you know, this kind of hot and hot thing. Whereas these days, if you talk to artists like Marla Ellison, for instance, is a friend of mine, so I know her more. There is this kind of reflection of the face, which is more homogeneous, more positive, doesn't struggle too much with who she is, but takes a good use of these knowledge archives from native Pueblo and uh, Euro-American ancestries. And this utilization of ancestral knowledge is there so much visible in her art, for instance, <coughs> um, paintings. For a short list, I guess most of the items that you see here, you might it might ring a bell to you, but a number of them are purely labeled as Native American writing, which is okay with me. It's just I like my students to know that those authors also have uh, this kind of blended heritage, and at some point they decided that they call themselves um, full-blooded Native American, and I don't want to get into that discussion because I'm not entitled who is full blood and who is like all this blood up onto misery. But the thing is that what I argue for is that those artists and authors that you see here from, uh, especially Darcy McNichols now, up to Joy Harjo, 
they utilize all these assets, these cultural assets in their writing, and there's a special sensibility for ethnic and ethno, ethno racial identity uh, formulation in their art and, and literature. So that's the only thing that I argue for, and nothing more, nothing less. Um, again, I'm sure that you know some of these uh, writers from US Southwest and even from Canada. Uh, and more recently, for instance, um, what's the name of this guy? Some of them get into trouble of just claiming indigenous sites but not really having those, like tribal heritage. Um, not those ones that you can see here, but like two or three over the last 20 years turned out not to have just only claim indigenous times. So that's another kind of a big question. Here are some of uh, the art pieces that I also include in the book and you find flyers of this book on your table. So um, for instance, Fitz Shoulder, he is um, an artist who had this um, half and half and still divided images of the cowboy and Indian, the coyote face where uh, the coyote can shape shift from in and out of the body, um, I mean the, the, the red face or white face, and for Marla and Diego Romero and uh, Will Wilson uh, and even Robson Spencer, she also was a participant of the Budapest Conference. This is not like, there is no centrality of the stigma or the, or the division or like an embracing of Okay, so this is the focus of research, and I just uh, pulled out the two books because I believe that uh, you can see just an example of how European scholars attempt to reflect the diversity that we see in North American country these days through from going Indian stories to landed heritage stories, and uh, and there's so much written up, and still, uh, it's so frustrating. I don't know how you felt about it, but some of the conferences go back all the time to the same thing of Indianism and, you know, Carme and Hooper and the images, which is like, it's done. It's, we, we don't want to have that more because it reinforces the same kind of statements that we want to get rid of, right? So, um, What the, the actual problems, related problems for the individuals are, and this is what comes out of fiction that I've read and, and discussed, is on the one hand similar to, like some of these problems are similar to just Native American, indigenous Canadian people and issues related to um, uh, individual social psychology of being um, indigenous. For instance, invisibility and proper ways of becoming visible and getting the voice, uh, getting rid of the Indianness part of any kind of a colonial agenda. Also, close definitions of who people are. You know, for mixed blood, it's just because they have been captured for hundreds of years as half-breed and kids of miscegenation and all the derogatory terminology. Obviously, they need more space to kind of figure out their identity. And what I personally find exciting is cognitive dissonance avoidance. Now, I have developed a whole chapter in the chart about it that I will just quickly show you. But the point is that I found in fiction, in literature, uh, and uh, secondary sources, a very direct correlation between a person's education, <laughs> cultural exposure, intercultural exposure, you know, living with a tribal community or not being urban or just purely farm distance from uh, actual uh, indigenous cultures. So several of the environmental factors, as well as the individual's own psyche and upbringing, have an impact on how an individual copes with cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is by birth there with that kid because 
Um, for instance, for Mala, German father, Pueblo mother, still they live on um, Laguna Pueblo. But for her, she didn't face um, any problem of who she is up until going to school. That's where you know, people have their first questions about, hey, so what about your daddy? And how come he, he lives here on, uh, on, in the Pueblo? So there, the cognitive dissonance factor kicks in when the child first faces uh, questions about identity that was natural so far, or had been natural for the same person for a long while. And then how she or he copes with that depends on uh, education, upbringing, stress tolerance, and a number of factors that we will see in a minute. I also deal with the consciousness, how conscious people are about identity making and and performing and projecting and how they cope with the difference between author's pride and ego recognized identity. So when I know that identity questions in Canada mostly have been part of 1970s up to the medium uh, quest for identity things, but even today uh, an expression of the gap, my new gap between how others feel about me, how I think you think of me, Right? It makes a difference, especially as compared to who I consider to myself to be. And um, today we heard some of the presentations touching upon discursive practices and discourse analysis required to, to give a context to all um, these investigations and to enable, for instance, students better understand the historical context of originality. Uh, in North America. So um, I know you can't see the details. I'm just giving you this as a first-hand look to uh, the process that I tried to um, depict in literature. So that's all the literary um, protagonists presenting some kind of a change. And there is always a triggering element that you see in fiction. Uh, that puts the character into motion about who he or she is and how he or she can cope with uh, questions of his identity and what kind of factors are there. And what I thought I would share with you, because I'm talking about literature but not really now, showing it to you uh, is firsthand, is an example. And that is Luis Ovex's Sharpest Night and the Sharpest Sight and Bone Games, two of his novels, because some of the factors that you saw in the previous chart are kind of reflected here. One is the so-called personal variables, individual background variables, such as upbringing and education. In that novel, you have Paul McCurtain as a divorced, um, allegedly white, but chocolate children, Irish college professor. And so, page 10, he says, what I know from books in school and those old TV movies is that Hogwarts can be trusted. as a killer, a betrayal, a creed. So, he goes to powwows. This is, I think, pretty common that people try to reconnect with simulate practices of, of uh, indigeneity for good or bad. And then, um, you know, um, maybe they participate in some of these practices and maybe they are happy with that or the community is happy with that, but that's a shaky procedure. But then there's another kind of exposure to grandparents and relatives and how they react to, you know, questions about uh, the person's identity. Um, grandma does not speak, uh, speaking of languages. At that time, she refused to speak um, Indian at home. Um, I think it's a protective act for the kid to assimilate into Anglo culture. At that time, this was, I think, pretty natural in some families. Whereas the grandfather, obviously of white European origins, he's a, a, a ashamed of marrying an Indian woman, which is also part from Darcy McNichols' The Surrounded. You can see how um, torn these families are and how, what about the difficulties for a child to be brought up in that um, really divided um, heritage. And then um, 
some of the other relatives, like Latina and Uncle Luther, they seem to be getting closer spiritually to, like, kind of pushing the guy into posing questions and really starting to explore uh, authentic indigeneity and, uh, and possible ways to, to reconnect in a more kind of a, a more mature way. So it's a learning process and depending on the individual, they can be stuck up or they can move on and reconnect to somewhat to Native American culture. For some other features like the conflict resolution between ultra sprite and people recognized identity, um, he says, I'm tangled, mixed, and interrelated. I'm half breed like my father, actually. I'm 383. So I guess that makes me a uh, 716th breed, almost a half breed like my father. So it's almost ridiculous that people are kind of so much hooked up from their school days to uh, the, the blood one to misery. And then, you know, uh, basically what, on the other hand, some of the relatives uh, show him is some kind of a more meaningful way to reconnect. For instance, the, the ceremony of returning goals uh, and the ceremony of reconnecting in a spiritual way to his family. So, just to wrap up on uh, Bone Games, his uh, other exciting novel, we mentioned yesterday at this table of the Bone Games and uh, collecting bones and all this kind of um, uh, uh, procedure. So here the process for Yagos are, for instance, is that he tries to build a new life and come to terms with his heritage but he, he's not able to on his own. So a college professor with very high education, what comes is there is a young um, Indian guy, native guy on campus, uh, Alex Chazzy, who actually very, like, you know, very, in a very aggressive way, um, challenges him and um, trigger, that's the triggering impact in his life. So. For instance, there is another trigger which is a Vietnam veteran brother who died and he has to relate to his, uh, collecting his bones somehow. So, um, beyond the confusion, what uh, seems to surface is the memory in the blood thing that some factors like the relatives, like all the triggering elements in, uh, that the fictional story uh, presents build up a new level of understanding who he is, but it's much less pigeonholes of identity, much more uh, kind of a liminal space to define and redefine <coughs> who they are. So I think I would pretty much end my presentation with uh, um, a wrap up on these narratives. And uh, sometimes I'm asked why I can use the term mixed blood because it's not PC anymore. Mixed blood, capital letter, one word is PC, and it's explained in the um, um, first chapter of the book as regards to the southwestern people of those who actually identify with this term, Pueblo, uh, Indian, and Euro American. Makes uh, more particularly German, Irish, Lebanese and uh, Spanish uh, mix. So that does not refer to, uh, you know, mulatto and other mixes. This is particularly a reference to um, Southwestern um, people of that sort. And I'd like to call, um, again, um, attention to how I reconnect this conference topic to repertory justice and um, racial uncapitalization as, as well as exploring the limits of indigeneity as possible ways to, to have a conversation on this topic. And I leave you with the last slide on these identities, what actually entails, what is the pattern. The pattern is that it's, it's a very difficult to return to indigeneity, especially at home especially if you haven't ever been connected to a particular tribe. Thank you for your attention, and uh, you know, uh, I'm open to discussion on any of those. I have plenty of more slides on the psychology, as well as uh, 
the sociology of, of uh, this literature, um, visual art, everything, but I think that my time is pretty much up. Thank you. All right.